Hey everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig coming at you for the first, the first prime time Ask the Bootmaker. Oh man, I am so pumped to be here today with Jake Houston. First prime time one ever. Okay, here he is. Here he is. Let's bring him in. Hey, Jake. Hey, how's it going? Good. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you. Oh, man, I'm so pumped for this. Like I was saying, this is the first prime time Ask the Bootmaker. And, man, I'm so happy to have you here. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. How's your day? It's good. You know, a little slow today. Um, but that's not bad. Got a lot of work done. So. Hey, that's always a good day. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I, I have a ton of questions that uh, I got from a whole bunch of folks out there online. And we're going to be getting into a whole bunch of different things here. But like, I wanted to start off with this one from Corlitos because it's like deep cred. Oh, he's right here. It's like he wants to know cred. What age did you start wearing boots? So I, uh, I think, you know, I had them when I was real young, like a toddler, you know, I think I wore them around, but once I started consistently wearing them, like every day, I was probably 15, I think. So I think that's when I started, when I got my first pair. And I think they were a pair of like Ariat Ropers, I think. I just bought them because they were like a hundred bucks. And I was like, yeah, Sweet. got boots. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh huh. Yeah, so how it all started. When, when you look back on that first experience with the Ariat, did anything about that experience make you want to be a bootmaker today? No, not necessarily. Um, the bootmaking thing kind of came around after several years. Um, so that was my first pair of boots, and I'd start buying them up at like thrift stores and stuff, and. Um, I'd, you know, get boots and boots and boots. And I had friends who worked at Boot Barn when I was in high school, so I'd be buying them with their discount. And I just always had these. I liked collecting them because I wore them all the time. And then it wasn't until, when was it? Uh, several years ago, I, I decided that um, I wanted to kind of branch out from leather tooling because I was, I was tooling belts and, like, dog collars and things of that nature. And then I decided from there that I kind of wanted to branch out and um, do something new. So it was either going to be saddle making or I was going to go into cowboy boots. And I, how I picked one was uh, I, I walked into a shoe repair shop in Reno and I said, hey, I, I want to learn how to make boots. I know you guys don't make boots, but. Could I like apprentice, spend some time, kind of see how they're put together and this and that? Because at that point, I'd been taking them apart. I was trying to kind of figure it out. Like I, I had a bunch of old pairs of boots. I'd kind of tear all apart, try and, you know, see what was going on. And then they just said, yeah, sure. So I started apprenticing in there, and then they gave me a job. And then once I was doing that, it, it kind of became more real because I was looking up YouTube videos, and then uh, my wife bought me the – Lisa Sorrell DVDs. So once I got the DVD set, then I just jumped right in. That's so cool. Uh, it's it's so cool to have have had an episode with Lisa too and have her talk about that DVD and how she wanted to have that effect and that you are part of that. Um, do you, what is what is your inspiration? Like, do you look to people uh, like Lisa Sorrell um, in wanting to start your own custom or are you coming at it from like a different background of wanting to do custom boot making and why start a custom cowboy boot company? The reason I started, I really wanted a pair of stingray boots. I just thought they were nice. Cool. Like I, I played music pretty seriously for a lot of years and being on stage and stuff. I always, I always did more flashy kind of honky tonk stuff. I was like, man, stingray boots would be, real cool to like have on stage and all that. Cause I was wearing a lot of snake skin and stuff like that. And uh, that was like, I, I want a pair. So I was just trying to find a pair of them right around the same time. I was thinking, Oh yeah, maybe I'll branch out into something new. And the only pair I could find was like a special order from Lucchese. And I think they were like $1,400 or something. I was like, Oh yeah, I can't do that. And I was like, no doubt. 
maybe I could just make them myself. So that's kind of how that happened. And how was that first uh, pair of Stingray boots that you made? I never, I still haven't made them. What? You still haven't made it? Nope. No. Nope. And I'm glad I haven't. I guess I need a lot more practice with it. You know, I've done, I've only used Stingray on one pair of boots. I used them on a heel counter cover. And uh, sewing Stingray is probably the worst endeavor I had, you know. But it, it worked out. But it was just, it's a pain to work with, so. Because it's just so hard? Yeah. So I think I think if I had started with that pair, I, I bought Stingray and everything. I had Stingray skins, and I bought like a like a pig suede uh, hide to do my tops out of. And I started like trying to make my tops, and um, that's when I got the DVD set. Started watching that, and realized yeah, that ain't gonna work. So I, I kind of transitioned and made a pair of black water buffalo calf boots. So. That was the first pair I made. And then uh, nice. still haven't touched the Stingray. <laughs> what do you think it, it will feel like when you finally do make that Stingray pair of boots? Is it going to be like a moment of this is, this is my dream right here? Or, or do you, is it kind of like something that you want to do but not at the same time because it made you want to get into boot making and you're afraid of what might happen when you actually make them? Yeah, mm, yeah you know, it's just it's one of these things now where it's like, I just don't, I don't know if I really want to wear a pair of stingray boots anymore. So, <laughs> you know, I've got, it, it's funny. Cause I started out, I was like, yeah, I want to make the stingray boots. And I couldn't quite, I was like, yeah, no, we'll wait on that. So I made this pair of water buffaloes and they were all jacked up. They were so bad, but <laughs> I still got them. I mean, the side seams, I sewed them on a flatbed sewing machine. So like after a couple weeks they just blew out like it was all oh, no. yeah it was a nightmare you know so i did that and then it's like i have a pair of like red ostrich boots that i made because uh of the alan jackson chattahoochee music video so that was like my next pair i made for myself and then i have a, I have a pair of alligators and now the past couple pair i've made for me have been just more of a like a work boot something i can wear every day without getting all messed up like i got a pair of just rough out tan suede ones and then i got a pair of like wax calf so that's kind of i'm like yeah i don't need any more for a while now but um yeah as far as i think making the stingray boots i think it would be cool to do it you know just kind of have that because there was like a i have a tattoo of a cowboy boot that i got before i started making boots and i kind of wanted that stingray boot to look like the tattoo that i have I thought, oh, you know, that, so it might still be cool to do, but. Cool. Well, I'm going to check back in with you in the future when you finally do make that boot, because I don't know, it might be a big momentous feeling that, you know, that's the reason why you got into it. And I want I definitely want to hear back about that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you said you were into music or are into music. Uh, you, you play regularly on stage and stuff. Can, can you tell me a little bit about your music? Sure. So it's, um, I do kind of like more traditional honky tonk country music. So real, real divey bar beer joint kind of stuff. Um, a lot like, uh, I don't know, like Hank Thompson would be, or a lot of those, uh, honky tonk Texas guys, you know, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, that, that kind of vein of country. Love it. Music. Yeah. Yeah. And I did, I did a couple <laughs> records over the past few years and then, um, once I started the boot making stuff and I wanted to open my own shop, it kind of fizzed out a little, but, um, planning to do another record here soon, but I'm going to take it a different direction and do uh, like traditional cowboy songs. So nice. That's, that's going to be fun to listen to now from your time on the road. Um, do you feel like playing out so much, you know, being on tour because that's a completely like different lifestyle um and it gets you you learn a lot from it because you talk to so many different people right so i'm wondering has your time on the road being on tour with a band um has that affected the way that you do business or build boots or just your outlook on your work now yeah you know it's um it's funny I, there's a couple 
couple things I would say on that. It's like, uh, I learned a lot from performing on how to talk to people, you know, cause I've always, I've always been a pretty shy dude, you know, and, um, you know, being on stage, you really got to kind of open up and, you know, talk to a crowd and do all that. So that taught me a lot about like salesmanship and, you know, the long and short of it. And then, um, learned a lot about patience dealing with a band all the time, um, which, you know, they're great, but it does, you can wear on each other's nerves pretty quick. So. Oh yeah. When you're spending in, in, that that's time with each other and like hotel rooms are like on the floors and basements or in vans, like it's a lot. <laughs> I think 90, 90% of being a musician, is not actually playing music. It's waiting around. So for the show to start or, you know, you sound check, then you got hours to kill. So it's, learned a lot of patience. And then the other thing um, that was a nice surprise was that, you know, because uh, there's not a ton of money in music for most people. And it was kind of a nice change to actually make a little bit of money doing things on my own with the cowboy boot stuff. So that was another, another nice surprise. I was like, man, I'm gonna have to work a whole, you know, you know, the work ethic thing was like, oh, you know, work just as hard doing music, but there's actually a little bit of money going into my pocket on this end so just that is that is a testament to like how hard it is to actually make money as a musician um because i mean you can't be rolling in dough making custom cowboy boots either right now right no 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 it's tough it's tough mm -hmm. it is tough yeah but you know it's um it's rewarding you know mm -hmm. it's worth it you know it's not like a I don't drive a new truck or, you know, I don't have a lot of nice things, but I got a roof over my head and, you know, I eat a meal, a, you know, three meals a day and I'm yeah. satisfied when I go home after working all day. So that's, that's probably the best thing for me. It's like, I, I had so much creative satisfaction with the music industry stuff that I have now found making cowboy boots. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and you're making some beautiful stuff too. Now, in the picture for this live stream, there was that pair with the with the blue tops. And um, can you tell me a little bit about that pair because that is so pretty. Yeah, thank you. That was um, the my client picked those out, and he is a uh, he's a world champion PBR bull rider. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so he. He had found me through a friend we have in common that I had made a pair of boots for about a year ago, who is another pro rodeo cowboy. And um, he, uh, he messaged me, I think in December, this client for those boots, these blue ones. And um, he, he was like, hey, man, I got to get a pair of boots. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I traveled to Sacramento to meet him at one of the bull ridings so I could measure his feet and all that. And they're... Uh, he, he loves them, which is great. And he's nothing, nothing short of an awesome dude, you know, and, um, he just wanted something real simple. So they're, that's a kid skin top with, uh, kangaroo vamps and counters, you know, not a lot to it, but, um, he loves them. That's so cool, man. What I was looking at that toe shape. What, what would you call that toe shape on that boot? I call that a vintage square. Okay. So it's kind of. It, what it is, it's just a box toe. So the insole is pulled over the front to make that, that shape. And I just, I just do it a little bit wider than you would normally because it's not – gives you a little bit more room, and it does look pretty slick without being one of those real wide, like, duckbill kind of square-toed boots. Yeah. That was – that's a, it's a real good look. Thank you. Um, let's see here. So I got a question from Carol about your mentor who is your greatest mentor in boot making so i have i have a couple of them um lisa was probably the most influential for me just because the dvd set and all that and she has been just so patient and helpful with me like i can email her and do all that like ask her anything and she'll she'll help me any way she can and then um 
so I've, I've had a lot of help from her over the years. And then uh, I have a mentor that I visit in person in Oregon named Richard Stapleman. And I go, I'll go spend like a week at a time with him, you know, once or twice a year. And it's just like, it's, it's great having people I can email and talk to over the internet that will help me. But, you know, spending, spending a week with someone in their shop, I, I learn months worth of things I would have taken a long time to figure out on my own. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of amazing how that all works. But how did you get linked up with him? Um, I just stumbled into his shop one day. I was, uh, my wife and I went to Pendleton for a rodeo they have called the Roundup. And cause it's a, it's a big rodeo. It's pretty unique. They do like, um, it's got like a grass field. They do the rodeo on. It's just a big deal. And it's in a small town. So it's kind of unique that way. Um, but we went up there and I just saw a custom boot shop and I just kind of walked in. And I was like, oh, I introduced myself and chatted with him a little bit. And then the next couple mornings we were there, I'd get up early and I'd just go sit in there and just kind of watch what he was doing. And then um, asked him if he taught classes. And he's like, no, I don't. I, you know, it's, he has a hard time getting students to continue in the craft. So he had stopped doing it for a while because it's a lot of effort, you know, to do those sort of things. And then, um, he just offered me to come out. He was like, yeah, well, you can come out and make a pair of boots. I'll, I'll help you. So he didn't, he hasn't ever charged me or anything. He's just been, he's just been the best, you know? So he's a good friend of mine now, you know? So it's kind of funny because I just, I was wearing that first pair of boots I made when I walked in there. I was like, oh yeah, I made these. And he was just kind of mind blown that I did it without any direction other than DVDs, you know? So, um, but yeah, that's, that's how I met Richard. Oh, that is so cool. Now, are you the type of person to go? Because it seemed like that might be a difficult step for some people to, to take, to um, go in there, um, talk with the person, and then actually just sit there and see if you know you could work with them in any way. Have you always been that kind of person to you know take that extra step on something that you're interested in like that? Um. Yeah, maybe if maybe if it's something that I'm super interested in, I will kind of kind of focus in on it and like I don't know, cuz I am I you know, I was always shy. So it's like meeting strangers and stuff. I didn't really have a lot to say most of the time, but in that instance, it was just I'd never met a bootmaker before. I've never seen one in person. I've never been to a boot shop. So it was just kind of mind-blowing to me. So I, it was one of those things where it's like I have to do this. So yeah, I don't know if I'm necessarily a guy that would go out of the box to do that in any regular instance, but I think this this time it just happened. This spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Wow, that 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 says a lot. Um, now you are working in your shop is in Virginia City, right now. So you do Oregon to um, Virginia City um, when you do do that trip. Um, what's it like in Virginia City? That's, I mean, that's not some place that, we, that uh, initially comes to mind to where maybe custom cowboy boots are made. Mm -hmm. So that's a question from Barry. I'm sorry, I didn't mention. It's Barry. Well, thanks, Barry. Um, so Virginia City is a, an old like gold and silver mining town started in the late 1800s and um, we have a lot of tourism up here you know we've kept most of the buildings on the main drag original so there's a lot of 1800s buildings um, a lot of old bars and stuff and just some real cool things to see here and then um, I found my friend Pascal he owns the shop that I'm in he is a custom hat maker and um, we kind of figured that we would like to have a shop up here that was historically correct as well as, you know, unique to the area. So it's like, cause there's, he's shown me newspaper articles from the late 1800s, early 1900s of advertisements from a hat maker up here. And then there's, there were boot and shoe makers up here as well. So that was kind of our vision with this, but um, it's a wonderful place to work. 
I mean, it's a small town, but we get a lot of people to come here every year. So it sounds like a, a such a pretty spot. Now, in your shop, you also work with two other crafts people, right? Um, now, what is that like working with two other people in sort of this busy place where you're all working on your own stuff? <clears throat> it's awesome. Um, you know, it's because we have uh, Pascal uh, Babylon and he makes hats. So he, he's a custom hat maker. He does this kind of stuff. And then we have a feller named uh, Kevin Leffler who makes shoes and other leather goods. Does a lot of exotics, um, works belts and wallets and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's great because it's fun to be in a place where you can work with people. Well, let me back up. I was working out of my house before I was in this shop. You know, so I was by myself all the time just doing, working off of internet orders and things like that. People would come to the house. But it's, the best part about this for me is that I'm in a shop with people who do their own craft, but we all kind of have the same thought process about things. I don't know, we have the same outlook on stuff, which, you know, we're all kind of kindred spirits, which is great, you know. Um, so sometimes I'll be stuck in a rut and then Pascal or Kevin will be able to kind of look at it and be like, oh, well, what if this worked? And, you know, we help each other out with different things quite often. That's cool. What would you say that outlook is that you guys all share, like um, to its core? Um, hmm, probably like, uh, taking pride in your work, I guess. Um, because at the end of the day, we all want to do our very best to make the best thing we can. I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest one, you know, because we, we're all in here. Like quite often, you know, we work real hard, but I guess when it comes right down to it, we, we all agree that we're very lucky to be able to do what we do because we, everything's so unique and we get to do something specific for a certain person and just do the best job we can. And that's, uh, that's, that's probably what it is. So. Even when you're working on a pair that you might not be that excited about building for somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I, I help a lot with design stuff because I'm, I'm pretty artistic. I've always drawn, like when I do leather tooling and stuff, I, I draw quite a bit. So, um, design stuff, I'll, I'll take different elements and I'll check in with clients as we go through the process. Like when I'm designing their tops and stuff to make sure that's what they want. Um, but, you know, my, my thing is I always try to make something that I would wear, you know. So it's like even if, even if it's something I, I wouldn't wear necessarily, I always, I'm always able to put enough of myself into it where it's, it's something that I can be happy with. Cool. So you've never taken that uh, – so you've never actually turned anybody's ideas like away uh, that was a question that I had from Clay. Um, he asks, have you ever had to, like, turn somebody down on an idea that they had for a pair of boots? You know, sometimes um, just, you know, there's uh, some design things that don't quite jive. Like, we'll change things from their original idea, but it's not necessarily – I don't necessarily turn them away. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, like, I had a – customer who wanted some uh feathers inlaid in a boot top and he wanted the little plumes of hair off the back of the feather to be in the shape of a like a Steelers logo or something but then we ended up going a different route just because that stitching that making it look realistic you know there's there's only so much we can do with a sewing machine and knives and inlays you know so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll switch directions sometimes but i've never i've never turned anybody away for design stuff um like if i i don't know the only time i would really turn someone away is like if it was like a anything hateful or you know like derogatory I mean, that's a no-go mm -hmm. yeah. but um other than that i mean i wouldn't really turn anyone away 
for boots. So, so that's that's really cool. Um, I respect that. Uh, what is your favorite leather to work with? Um, I mean, we have some questions about boot prices from Barry and um, like kangaroo boots, but I'm wondering like what also is your favorite leather? Well, you know, I there's not a lot I don't like to work with. Like there's a wax calf that I just started using recently that I love and it's just mm -hmm. really tough, strong stuff. I love working with that. I love, uh, there's not a ton of bad ones, you know? Like ostrich is a bit of a pain just because it doesn't like to last all the time. Like sometimes it'll bubble and wrinkle in places it shouldn't. It's kind of tricky, but I still I still like working with it. I, kangaroo is probably one of my favorites. Like kangaroo nice. a lot. Just it's so soft and it's so strong and pliable. It lasts great all the time. It's it's a dream to work with. Um, good alligator skins are always fun. Elephants always fun. Like, um, yeah, cap, good calf skins. Like, there's just, there's not a ton I, I wouldn't like to use. So, cool. That's awesome. Uh, what are what are your boot prices? Like, where does where does that start for you? So my my prices start at a thousand for a pair, um, and that'll be you know it's like any toe shape or any heel height. We'll do twelve inch tops or less. And then that would be for like a pig suede or a rough out or just like a calf skin with kid skin tops. So, um, and it changes from there. I'll do like four rows of stitching. Sometimes I'll include like a little bit of inlay if it's just like a brand or something. We'll, we'll throw that on there, but everything else would be extra. <laughs> yeah. And what about the kangaroo leather, the number 12? Yes. Um, so something like that, I think, oh, what was that one? I think it was probably around 1200 bucks for what that boot was. Wow. So, yeah. That's not bad at all. Did you hear that folks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty new to boot making. So I, my prices now go up every year a little bit percentage wise, but this was kind of my start price. Like I opened my shop a little bit over a year ago and that was like my starting base price just cause I was still a little self-conscious like a year ago making boots for folks. Cause I'd only done it for friends. I'd never made boots for a stranger who paid full mm -hmm. price for them. So, um, I'm, I'm feeling a lot more confident now. So it's like every year there'll be a slight increase, but yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Talking about the the price of boots and stuff, um, I got a really cool question from uh, Eduardo about where you think traditional boot making fits in the modern ep economics, um, where you know it's so much focus on the large manufacturers right now. Yeah, you know, I think we both need each other. Large manufacturers need. Uh, boot makers, whether they know it or not, and boot makers need large manufacturers. Because if we if we had to keep up with uh, making boots for everybody that wanted to wear them, it never happen. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just not there's not enough of us to be able to do that. For one, and for two, I you know, with how fast you'd have to make them and all that, the the quality would go downhill. So I you know, you'd end up just running a small manufacturing place anyways. So I think it. I think we work together just fine. Uh, we need each other because um, without without a large manufacturing company, there wouldn't really be a place for us. Uh, you know, like what what they do makes our craft more special, more sought out. You know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, there's there's always going to be that single person, that single craft person who does every single bit of it. Yeah. Do you, do you take away anything from that process now from, you know, buying those first pair of boots and knowing that it might have gone through like several people's hands to now you building your own boots with your own hands from start to finish? You know, I've, I haven't ever thought about it too much, but 
um, it is something I've, I'm proud of, you know. Um, I like I'm, I like that I'm a one-man shop. I like that I do every single thing on that boot, you know. Not, not to say that uh, a shop with multiple people making one pair is wrong at all, but I, I, I take a lot of pride out of it. Mm -hmm. And just learning so much um, over my apprenticeship with the, the shoe repair and just kind of this whole journey, just learning the quality and care that go into a pair from one single person or a, or a custom boot maker per se is just, there's nothing like it. So even for the folks who just beat the shit out of their boots all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like there's, we can make boots that will last a whole lot longer than any pair you'd buy off a shelf, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the hard thing. Like I, I make boots for working cowboys. Like I, most of my consume most of my consumer base is like uh rodeo folks cowboys and then just like fashion boots but um you know it's hard to get a working cowboy because cowboys don't you know pay a whole lot of money it's you know once it's hard for them to pull the trigger on a, a pair of boots that's like 1200 bucks you know which i understand but usually they can get five years out of one pair you know, if you use the right materials and stuff versus three months out of a $250 pair of boots, you know, and yep. that's at first they're like, oh man, that's, that's, that's hefty. But you know, over the savings over time makes a lot more sense to me at least. <laughs> so, yep. that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. But that's the thing about it. And you know, with uh, big, big companies, there's always going to be people who are perfectly, they don't want to spend more than. 250 bucks on a pair of boots and that's okay you know yep yeah yeah i i think it's so great that there's just such a range of boots for you know different types of people um depending on what you need them for i think um boots get a bad rap a lot of times for you know only being for for cowboys or if you wear them that you're a cowboy but in reality it's like so much bigger than that so, I mean, it's, it's great that, that uh, you're making them um, because I think that it really needs to be done. And I just want more people to get into it. Do you have anything like advice for people who are interested in getting into this line of work since um, you're still like you within the past six years or seven years have gotten into it? And I mean, talking with people who have been in it for 30 years, they still feel new at it. So what, is, what does that look like to you if you have any advice for people just coming into it? Don't, don't be afraid to ask. Because that, that was my thing at first. When I first started getting into it, I was kind of nervous to talk to folks about it. But uh, most everybody I've run across in our small industry as, is an open book you know, they're all helpful. There's plenty of, plenty of makers that offer apprenticeships and things like that. And, you know, if you really want to do it, I'd, I'd recommend getting an apprenticeship to start because you'll save yourself a lot of heartache <laughs> and <laughs> time just figuring it out on your own. Um, but yeah, that would, that would be my advice. If, if you really want to get into it, um, first, like recognize that it is very, it is difficult you know, every, every pair of lasts you build is there's, is the difficulty to it because you need to figure that out. You know, every, every pair of feet's different. You, and you're also, not only are you making the boot fit, but you're also, um, you have to perceive what they think fit is, which is something Lee Miller taught me about. And it's just like, you have to figure out the balance between the two. So everything is a, a puzzle. It, it's a difficult thing to do, but if you take, I don't know, if you like doing those kind of things and you want to get into that, ask people, like ask questions, try and try and get an apprenticeship with that because it's, you know, there's most boot makers uh, want the trade to go on. So <laughs> it's, uh, they, they usually don't mind helping folks out who want to learn. Have you known anybody who has stopped um, in the process of becoming a bootmaker? Um, and was there reason because they weren't 
outgoing enough to reach out to other bootmakers? No, I haven't. I, you know, I'm, I haven't really met a ton of bootmakers in person, you know, cause most bootmakers are in Texas, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a far away from Texas. <laughs> so it's like, I think the last bootmaker who lived in my area moved to Texas like 12 years ago. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, you know, it's not a very common thing to find, but, um, I've just heard other stories from, uh, like different makers about friends who are like learning and then we're just like, eh, it's too much. Like, I, I don't know. But, um, I think there's a certain, uh, diligence you have to have to do it, you know? So it's a lot yeah. of, like for me, it was a lot of trial and error and, you know, it's one of those things where, um, if something knocks you down you just got to get back up and do it again and yep. get it right. And that's something that I've just is just so why I love talking to 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 bootmakers like you is because it seems like um, in order to make a boot that just can get the shit beat out of it and still show up like it's got to be made by a maker who has been beating the shit out of by his boots. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. It's a. uh... It's a trade that deserves respect. <laughs> yeah, mad respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you guys get some wisdom out of it too. Yeah, and you have to you have to respect the boots too. You know, it's a it's a whole lot of that. But well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Like, I respect what you do one hundred percent because that is not easy, and you make it look good. So respect. Um, do you have a website? And how can people go about ordering from you? Uh, do they have to be present for a custom fitting? Like, what's the process? So I don't, I don't have a website. It's, you know, shame on me. I know, um, but you know, most most of my orders that don't come through the shop doors are like uh, people reach out on Instagram. So that's that's my main outside source of inquiries, I guess. Um, but yes, uh, to to purchase a pair, like, I I would make a pair of boots, not custom fit, but the problem is, it's like, that's that's kind of why I do this, you know? So it's, you're not going to get your money's worth, I don't think, if it doesn't uh-huh. fit exactly how it should. So yes, I, I take all measurements in person, um, and that's that's how that starts, so. That's awesome. Well, everybody on the stream right now and watching afterwards, you gotta link up with Jake on Instagram. Uh, The Instagram is Houston Boot Co. That's right. That's awesome. Jake, thank you so much for spending this time with me. This is great. Thank you, Jeremiah. I hope you have a great rest of your night and uh, thanks everybody for watching too. Peace. All right, thanks.